Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Red Arrow, B, 0, 6. So, let me get this straight. While I was on ice, you found another Roy Harper, the sidekicks formed their own team, aliens invaded the Earth, and Ollie grew that dopey goatee? We try not to call ourselves sidekicks. You don't like the goatee? So missing the point. You've both been talking around it all day. Now I want answers. What happened to me? How can there be another Roy Harper? And what happened to my arm? Okay, okay. We wanted to wait until you were strong enough, but I guess the moment's here. Moment's passed. Get to it. Hello team. Welcome to the Watchtower, and welcome also to our seventh installment of Secret Origins. In this series, we'll be diving into the history of the main characters in Young Justice, the heroes, the supporting cast, and even the villains. Today, we celebrate Young Justice's second oldest sidekick, Roy Harper, a.k.a. Speedy, a.k.a. Red Arrow, a.k.a. Arsenal. Uh, note that in this episode of Secret Origins, I'll be discussing both seasons of Young Justice, but also parts of the live-action Arrow series as well. Though we have no idea what will happen in Young Justice Outsiders, some of the arcs for Roy that we discuss here could spoil what's to come, so keep all that in mind. In addition, Roy's history, both his original 20th century and kind of his current 21st century history, are both filled with some pretty heartbreaking moments and intense storylines of drug addiction, human trafficking, and more, so be warned about that. And with all of that out of the way, let's dive in. Roy's first appearance as Speedy was More Fun Comics number 73 in November of 1941. His first appearance as Arsenal was in New Teen Titans number 99 in July of 1993, where he also acquired so many pockets. Guys, the 90s, so many pockets in the 90s. Go look at an old Deathstroke picture. It's amazing. His first appearance as Red Arrow was actually in the kind of speculation or Elseworlds comic Kingdom Come, which you heard me talk about in our Kid Flash episode. So his first appearance there as Red Arrow was in Kingdom Come number two in June of 1996. But his first appearance in the normal continuous storyline as Red Arrow didn't happen until 11 years later in Justice League of America number seven, May of 2007. Roy was created by Mort Wessinger and George Papp as Speedy. Arsenal was created by Marv Wolfman and Tom Grummet, and his Red Arrow appearance, of course, was Mark Wade and Alex Ross, the writers and artists for Kingdom Come. Now, like most of the Titans, Roy is not the only one who has had his sidekick identity of Speedy, just like Kid Flash, Robin, and the others. Mia Dearden appeared in Green Arrow, Volume 3, Number 2, in May of 2001, and four years later, three and a half years later, became Speedy in Green Arrow, Volume 3, Number 44, in January of 2005. And she was created by Kevin Smith and Phil Hester. Now, this first part of Roy's story takes place basically between 1941 and around 1992-93. Roy, of course, is well known as the second oldest sidekick in DC Comics history, though I didn't realize that he went as far back as 1941. And in 1971, back when I was one year old, Roy was the subject of an award-winning comic series, two-issue series, the first issue of which is called Snowbirds Don't Fly. Snowbirds Don't Fly depicted Roy's battle with drug addiction. It was a pretty cornerstone moment in comics because it began to show... American comic readers, what comics could do in stories. But before that, Roy's original origin shows him as the son of a forest ranger who died in a fire. He was taken in and he was raised by a Navajo uh, quote unquote medicine chief because 1941 named Brave Bow because 1941. <laughs> he was taught not only how to hunt and how to shoot, but he was taught quote Native American skills. He wasn't adopted by Oliver Queen until after Brave Bow's death. So, of course, Speedy was one of the original members of the Titans, and early on in his career, I don't see him as being quite the angry, bitter person that we see in modern interpretations, basically from 1971 on. Uh, he had originally been dating Donna Troy, who was the original Wonder Girl. We'll get to her in a later episode. 
Uh, unfortunately, a little while after the Titans came together, Roy and Ollie's fortunes kind of took a turn for the worse. The Titans had disbanded for a period of time. Uh, Roy and Donna split. And then Ollie lost both uh, his fortune and also began neglecting Roy. So around this time, there was a comic series called the Green, Ar- Green Arrow and Green Lantern. In this series, Green Arrow and Green Lantern were traveling around the United States. Uh, I think they also might have gone to some other countries, but they were traveling around the United States, and Ollie was trying to show how basically the quote-unquote common little people, right? The Basically the Green Arrow liberal hippie showing the Hal Jordan kind of conservative space cop, you know, real America. And had some interesting storylines. Everything was a little bit over the top, but was pointing a finger at some things having just, you know, come not far out of the civil rights movement and in the 1970s. But while they were traveling around the United States, Roy became addicted to heroin. And in this award-winning story, Roy's secret was revealed to Green Arrow by Hal, and Oliver's reaction was not good. Ollie basically punched Roy out and then threw him out on the street. So Ollie later found him and brought him to Black Canary. Uh, I haven't read the comic in a while, so I don't know if Ollie apologizes or, or what his deal was there. But Black Canary stayed by Oliver's, excuse me, Roy's side while he went through his withdrawal. This whole situation with both Roy's addiction and Oliver punching him out and kind of abandoning him a second, at least a second time caused the two of them to have some huge arguments and stop working together. And it also caused Roy basically to stop being speedy. When the Teen Titans got back together, he, he would help them from time to time. But Roy focused on other things in his life. He was often shown as like a counselor for various uh, drug programs. He also established uh, quite a number of government contacts. And then he was hired as Roy Harper, hired by DC Comics kind of fusion of the FBI and the CIA called the Central Bureau of Investigations, which kind of evolved into Checkmate, which is a major organization, was a comic series of its own. And he was hired as a drug enforcement agent. Of course, during that time, while he was a drug enforcement agent, he had gone undercover at one point in order to arrest Cheshire or, you know, flip her to the good guy's side. Of course, you can suspect what happened there. They ended up having an affair. Roy was concerned about his presence in her life being a danger to her and left, unaware that she was pregnant with his child, Leanne. So... Eventually, Roy realized that he was Leon's father. He had gone on a mission with Nightwing to track down Cheshire and prevent her from assassinating a group of diplomats because Cheshire will be Cheshire. Roy was captured but freed by Nightwing, who also brought Roy his daughter. Cheshire had basically left Leon in Roy's care. So now we get into around the early 1990s to early 2000s. From around 1993 to 2004 or 5, Roy joined a new version of the Titans. He discovered that he and Leanne are descendants. This gets a little bit bonkers. He discovered that he and Leanne are both descendants of Vandal Savage. He saved Leanne and some other children from human traffickers, which is a really hard story to read, being a dad, and uh, established basically the next incarnation of the Outsiders which included the veteran outsider Metamorpho. He was the member of the original Batman and the Outsiders comic, along with uh, the character of Black Lightning, Jefferson Pierce. Grace Choi, just known as Grace, and Anissa Pierce, who is known as Thunder, and she's the daughter of Jefferson Pierce, the original Black Lightning. And then also this, there's a futuristic android named Indigo, who was later revealed to be Brainiac 8. So, of course, you're familiar with Brainiac, who's the Superman villain. In the 30th or now 31st century, there is a character known as Brainiac 5, who is a hero that works with the Legion of Superheroes. Brainiac 8 was apparently three generations past uh, Brainiac 5. And then also the character of Jade, who was the daughter of the Alan Scott Green Lantern of the Justice Society, who was born with basically the Green Lantern powers without having to have a ring. And Alan Scott's Green Lantern abilities were actually magical. And depending on which Ritcon origin you you see, 
there was a wizard who had seen one of the kind of the Hal Jordan, John Stewart Green Lanterns crash on Earth, and he designed a lantern that uh, was magical and a ring that was magical that basically duplicated the technological powers of the uh, Guardians rings. And Alan Scott had that ring during the original Justice Society run back in the back in the 1940s. So Nightwing was also kind of a periodic member of this outsiders group, acting as leader, sometimes acting as a consultant, etc. So from 2005, in 2005 to 2011, Roy moved away from this leadership role with the outsiders and joined the league officially. And it was after Final Crisis when Roy returns to the league after discovering that Hal and basically the splintered Justice League have been hunting down and torturing criminals. Things got odd there for a little bit. So Roy and Ollie start working together again, but then a villain named Prometheus ends up cutting off Roy's right arm. So this is where we get the original comic story of Roy losing his arm. And unfortunately, in that same story arc, the Electrocutioner blows up Star City, which kills his daughter. So Roy, who, you know, becomes conscious days or weeks later, gets a little angrier at the world. These uh, basically flesh-eating bacteria or uh, nanites that were in his stump from his arm being cut off um, basically prevent him from getting any normal kind of prosthetic limb. So he's given an enhanced artificial limb, just like he does in Young Justice, but instead of being created by Lex Luthor, this one was built by Cyborg and Dr. Midnight, so who is a character from the original Justice Society. This kind of prosthetic limb was used in a similar way that we see it in Young Justice in many ways, but man, it was gritty at that point in time because his it didn't do anything for his pain. So between his continuous phantom limb pain and his daughter's death and all the stresses of everything that was going on in his life, he goes he goes back into his drug addiction and becomes paranoid. It just it really gets ugly. So basically, when it, while he's locked in these, this delusional paranoia from all of these terrible things, Roy murders one of the accomplices to Leanne's death and then basically becomes a villain. And at that time, Deathstroke had created this basically evil Titans organization. I spoke about this a little bit in Miss Martian's background as well, because in that evil Titans organization, there was a woman named Sun Girl who theoretically was from the future and knew about McGann, who McGann became, becomes in the future. And Roy joins this new basically evil Titans. That leads us to 2011 with the new 52 re- reboot. So they reboot everything. We find out that Roy in this new reboot is actually a part of an organization or a group called Red Hood and the Outsiders where Jason Todd now leads the team, and Roy actually considers Jason his best friend. Uh, Leanne never existed. His prosthetic arm's gone. He's got, like, he's got a regular arm, his, his old arm back. He has a s- weirdly more lighthearted tone. He's a former alcoholic instead of a drug addict, and his relationship to Oliver was kind of one more of, like, employee-employer as opposed to Oliver actually having him be his ward. So Roy had been working with Oliver's company, but when he discovered that Oliver had been using Roy's technology as his own, Roy was fired by Oliver and left to his own devices. Once again, things get a little weird. So as Roy remembers, he starts remembering the Titans, like Starfire, but Starfire doesn't remember him, including her long-term relationship with Nightwing she doesn't remember from the pre-52 Roy and Corey, uh, Starfire, Coriander, even start kind of a rocky relationship, which it just gets weird. That just, I can't sit with that. <laughs> so I think it's, it's a very get off my lawn moment. I don't know what that is. Uh, in the new 52 Rebirth, though, his former relationship with Ollie, as well as his previous drug addiction, uh, basically restored back to the continuity. So then he was a ward, and now he's back to being a drug, addic- drug addict, etc. And that's basically where it leaves us. So, 
I want more from Roy. And things get, I talked a little bit about in our Kid Flash episode about what happens with Wally and that Wally had been written out of existence in the New 52. Uh, and then in the rebirth, he basically comes back into existence and reminds the Titans who they were. And so the current Titan series, which I've read a few issues of, is fantastic, has this, you know, recompilation together of some of the original Titans. And uh, it's great. I, I need to get some more time to read more. So the other Speedy that we need to talk about is Mia Dearden, the second Speedy. She was a teenage runaway who had been abused by her father, manipulated into prostitution. She was rescued by Ollie and taken in as his new ward. So Oliver and Oliver's son, via Shadow, who's a character from Longbow Hunters, uh, which is a great miniseries from back in the 90s, I want to say. might be late 80s. Oliver and his son, Connor Hawk, trained Mia in both archery and martial arts, with her eventually, at least years later in our real timeline, taking over the mantle of Speedy. Mia was also the first superhero in mainstream comics to be HIV positive. So the character of Speedy is one that really keeps breaking barriers. I think a lot of people look at Roy frustratingly in the first season of Young Justice as this kind of over-the-top, angsty, even more than Superboy, angry guy. But that character has allowed for so much change and foundations to be laid for the changes that we see in modern-day comics. Back to Mia, the character of Thea Queen in the live-action Arrow series, her middle name is actually Dearden, giving a nod to the character of Mia Dearden, who eventually becomes Speedy, uh, and, and Thea actually eventually becomes Speedy in the show. Mia also made an appearance in the ninth uh, season of the live-action Smallville series as well. In the comics, Mia was supposed to have been watching Leanne at the time that Electrocutioner and Prometheus blew up Star City. And that fact that of Leanne's loss weighs heavily on her. Unfortunately, I don't have much information on the current state of Mia in the new 52 Rebirth and would love to hear anything. If, if anybody has been reading New Rebirth and you know what's going on with Mia, please get a hold of us either at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com or on our Twitter account or Facebook uh, at our Tumblr somewhere and, and let me know if there's any interesting or good storylines going on with Mia in the current, current runs. So let's talk about the power sets here. Mostly we're talking about Roy here. So both in the comics and in Young Justice, Roy is primarily an archer with trick arrows a la Green Arrow. Though, of course, at times, at least he, with the various clones of Roy in Young Justice, he gets, of course, this uh, cybernetic limb after he loses his right arm. And that limb was created by Lex and has a range of weapons, including a line launcher and laser cannon, etc., etc. I don't remember the... uh, cybernetic limb in the comics being quite as diverse as the one that they had in Young Justice. I I could be wrong, though. In addition to that, Roy and Mia both are highly skilled martial artists and acrobats, and I don't know as much about Mia, but Roy is also a pretty brilliant tactician, which I think is made pretty evident in Season 2 of Young Justice when we see Arsenal going to town on Lex and Mercy with one arm. He uses some incredible, it's an incredible fight scene that shows a lot of his skill and ability. And though he doesn't play well with others in most incarnations of him, modern incarnations, he's got a level of field knowledge and experience that really rivals Nightwing, making him an excellent leader when the need arises or, you know, when people do what he tells them to do. So now let's talk about him in, in Young Justice as opposed to the comics. Every depiction of Roy has had anger issues at least from around the 60s on. In the comics, it stemmed from Ollie turning him away, and in Young Justice, we see both the original and the clone Roy as being angry. The clone in the very first episode was angry largely because of his programming, at least as far as we know, that drove him to become a part of the League, though we wouldn't understand that, obviously, until the finale of season one. The original Roy had a right to be angry, considering he had been kidnapped, abandoned, tortured for eight years, but you can't help but think that both Roy's had an underlying disposition, right? Aggravated by their circumstances. Yet we also find out that an older Roy clone, James Harper, a.k.a. Guardian, was basically as level-headed as they come. 
So it's interesting that the nature versus nurture conversation becomes, I don't know, layered or intriguing here. Does James Harper, Guardian, have the potential for being this angry, but he just didn't have the same trauma as the other two? I don't know. Though Roy is full of anger in Young Justice, I just I have a hard time not seeing it as the dark side of being basically a passionate human being. Where Wally's passion manifests itself as deep friendship and love, Roy is angry at a lot of loss and pain for himself and his family. We don't know anything about his origin, at least in Young Justice. We don't know when he was adopted or brought in as a ward or partner to Ollie. So he could have been 8, 9, 10 when his father died, if his father was still a ranger. Uh, or he could have been maybe younger when his father died, but then when his adopted you know, Native American father died. So he's basically lost two parents, you know, two father figures, and now he has Oliver. It's just this, there's a lot going on with this kid. And when he confronts Artemis in Young Justice and tells her not to hurt his friends, it contrasts so much with how he's actually treating his friends. His condescension and frustration with their role in the team. In fact, it's interesting that he stays angry at the broader team until Aqualad comes to his aid to protect Luther and the Relation diplomats. Once Sportsmaster reveals to Aqualad that they may have a mole, Roy's attitude changes and he says he'll be there if and when they need him, kind of bringing him closer to the team and being able to keep a much closer eye on the mole investigation. So it all fits with this idea of, okay, I had to reach out to Aqualad, now he's helped me, so now I'm going to get closer to the team. But it also times it interestingly with the idea that now Aqualad knows there's a mole, so they want to keep an eye on this mole and investigation. And as Roy says in the finale, one of his hypnotic suggestions seemed to be pointing the mole finger at other people that aren't him. So with the long history of Arsenal and the Outsiders and Red Hood, I can't help but think that he's going to take on a leadership role in season three, seeing that it's titled Outsiders. Virgil, Asami, Ty, and Ed. We know that Black Lightning was a member of the Outsiders in the comics, and we know that Black Lightning was shown in the artwork that was confusing at San Diego Comic-Con where they showed the character that turned out to be Black Lightning where everyone was like, oh, you know, it must be Aqualab, but it's weird because his hair is the wrong color and he looks a little older. Like, we were very confused about who this character was. I mean, really, like, as I, as I was saying, as Young Justice Outsiders is literally the title of the season, and it involves an intergalactic metagene weapons ring, I can't help but think that the Outsiders are going to be led by the original Roy, and we're going to get to see some really interesting interactions with Virgil and the rest of the team. So... I have a few recommendations for for books to read, as I've already mentioned. Issues number 85 and 86 of the Green Lantern, Green Arrow series, Snowbirds Don't Fly. And the second one is They Say It'll Kill Me, But They Don't Say When, which is the second comic. We'll have links in the show notes to that one. And then the second one I think you guys should check out is Arsenal number one through four, a story arc called Six Degrees, where Leanne develops this life-threatening disease and Vandal Savage discovers that Roy and Leanne are descendants, as I mentioned earlier, which is crazy to me, and that they may be able to, in some way, extend his own life. So I have no idea if they're going to wrap something like that in, but it makes me wonder, is this the reason why Vandal picked Roy in some specific reason to be cloned? Vandal definitely plays the long game, so we'll see. Yeah, so check out that. Arsenal number one through four, six degrees, and issues number 85 and 86 of the Green Lantern Green Arrow series. We'll have links to those in the show notes. So that wraps up episode seven of Secret Origins. Next time, we'll be stretching out to the first of two members introduced later in the first season, fan favorite, Zatanna Zatara. So you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash crashing the mode, on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, www.crashingthemode.com. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings really do help others find the show. 
If you do leave us a rating or a review, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder for those. And even though Season 3 has been officially announced and is now a year in production, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology to get us more comics, more stories even sooner, and get yourself up to speed for the Season 3 premiere. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.